In today's video, I'm going to be sharing with you my favourite witchcraft books that I read in 2021. So if you're interested to see what made it to the top of my list, then get yourself a nice hot drink, settle back, relax and enjoy. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope that you are all well and safe and taking care of yourselves. In today's video, I really wanted to share with you my favourite witchcraft books that I read in 2021. So not all of these books came out in 2021, but they are my favourite books that I read last year in 2021. And I think I've so enjoyed watching these videos from other practitioners and witches, and I wanted to share the same because a lot of these books have been so profound and supportive in my practice and I really really think that they could help a lot of people, benefit a lot of people, so I want to share them with you right now. So a couple of these books I've mentioned already in a few other videos and one of them specifically being a video around books about traditional witchcraft and I loved filming that video. It was so helpful for me even just to be able to talk about each of the books and discuss like what I found helpful in each of the books just for my processing as well. So I'm also hoping that this will help others as well as myself to kind of clarify some of the ideas that came through with some of these books. So I'm going to start with the oldest book on this list and this is a classic and this is Mastering Witchcraft by Paul Hewson and this is a practical guide for witches, warlocks and covens. I have been intrigued to read this book for years but I felt always a little bit overwhelmed by it that perhaps it was kind of outside of my ability maybe to read. Paul Hewson is the author of Mystical Origins of the Tarot, The Devil's Picture Book, Mastering Herbalism, How to Test and Develop Your ESP, The Coffee Table Book of Witchcraft and Demonology, and two fiction works, The Keepsake and The Offering. So this is a classic since 1970. Mastering Witchcraft is one of the best how-to manuals for those wishing to practice traditional European witchcraft as a craft rather than a new age religion. So this is all about operative magic and the actual practice of witchcraft rather than that sort of spiritual tie or rather than it being kind of from a Wiccan perspective and you know for 1970s that was a really really important thing I think. And from the 1970s as well a lot of the books that were being written were around Wicca so that is a really really amazing tool to have. It says here starting from first principles Hewson instructs novice step by step in the arts of circle casting, blessing and the uses of amulets and talismans, filters, divination, necromancy, wax and images, not fascination, conjuration, magical familiars, spells to arouse passion or lust, attain vengeance and of course counter spells to exercise and then all the malice of others. So this is such a fantastic work and I made so many notes in this book as well. So I love this section, this is a dreaming oil. There are so many fantastic little points here about necromancy and working with different herbs as well as utilising sigils from the Lesser Key of Solomon to work with different spirits etc. So there's a sigil of Asago there. These are the lamps of art and then like a scrying medium. So the idea being that you see into the stone within a triangle. And a lot of this information comes from much older occult texts, so grimoires and such, such as the Lesser Key of Solomon and from Eliphas Levi. As with any good book, there are lots and lots of book recommendations in the back and it's all separated out into different topics as well. So if you wanted to look into mythology, there's different things here. So James Fraser, The Golden Bough, Robert Gray, the White Goddess, Louis Spence, The Fairy Tradition in Britain, there's Alistair Crowley's Magic Theory and Practice, Carl Jung, The Interpretation of Nature as Psyche, so modern developments of witch power, and The Witch Cult, so it references Gerald Gardner's Witchcraft Today and all of Gardner's books, The Gospel of the Witches, Aradia by Charles Goffrey Leland, Margaret Murray's The Witch Cult in Western Europe, Reginald Scott's The Discovery of Witchcraft, a book that I actually recently picked up, and Matthew Hopkins' Discovery of Witches. So there's historical text here, mythology, magical practice from a Kabbalistic perspective, arcane traditions, you've got Karl Pepper's Herbal from Herbal Law, so there's recommendations here at the back in the bibliography for further reading. And there's a glossary as well which is really helpful. At the back there is a table of planetary hours which is really really useful if you haven't got any other book on planetary magic, you know it's right there for you. So you can start, you know, utilising planetary magic even if you haven't read into more about it. There's a recipe at the back here that I love, the Sabbath cakes, which is something that I used to make when I was younger in my practice. When I first came to my practice, I think I found a recipe online. So that's lovely, the Sabbath wine here with violet blooms, Sabbath incenses. There's information here on covens, vengeance and attack, not magic, really amazing. This is such an amazing book, honestly, like I couldn't even counter magic and protection so you've got here herbal mixes for different protection workings you've got a protection bath 
recipe here using vervain for protection. Here you have a chant for when you craft a rowan cross, so to use rowan twigs and a red yarn or thread by this cross of rowan, uh, da da da, and then hang the cross around your neck, etc. So lots of different protection charms that are much older that he has brought into this book. There's just so much in this book. This is one of the best, one of the best books I have ever read on traditional witchcraft and like operative magic. There's so much in here, and actually this chapter as well on spells for lovers. Fantastic, so beautiful. I want to reread this, I think, as well. There's a love knot spell here. There's an invocation to the horned one, Eco Eco Azarak. And throughout there is planetary talismans as well as the Sator Square. So there's just so much in here. I would highly recommend anyone who hasn't read this book to just read this book. If you're interested in any form of magic or witchcraft, read this book, please. Because it is just so full of fantastic wisdom and knowledge. And yeah, couldn't recommend it enough. Next up is a lovely, lovely book that works almost as a narrative and a story, almost like an autobiography, but actually there's so much magical wisdom and knowledge and experience in this book, and it is Alice Tarbuck's A Spell in the Wild, A Year and Six Centuries of Magic. Now, when I first saw this book a few years ago, I think I fell into the trap of thinking, it's an Instagram book, because look how pretty. There's not really gonna be much of substance here. And just to judge a book by its cover, like just because it's beautiful and it looks modern and it's got a title like A Spell in the Wild that sort of sounds quite spiritual and quite woo, it threw me and, you know, hands up, like I was completely wrong because this is a beautiful, beautiful book. I decided to first read this book as an audiobook at the beginning of the year because I was struggling to sleep when we went into another lockdown here in England and I was homeschooling my kids. It was a very, very anxious time and I wanted something that was calming. And as soon as I sort of listened to the sample and heard Alice's voice, because Alice narrates, I thought, this is a book I'm gonna to want to read. And then my mother, a few weeks later, actually gifted me a copy of the book. There are some spells as well at the end of each chapter. So it is nice to have the book as a hard copy, but because of the nature of the book that sort of narrates different events in Alice's life, it does work really, really well as an audiobook if you are that way inclined, if you do listen to audiobooks. So it says on the back here, witches occupy a clear place in contemporary imagination. We can see them emerging from the corners of the past, mad, glamorous, difficult, strange. They haunt the footnotes of history, from medieval witches burning at the stake to the lurid glamour of the 1970s witchcraft revival. But they are moving out of history too. Witches are back. They are feminist, independent, invested in care for the self and the world. They are here because they must be needed. Part primer, part chronicle, a fresh and personal account of a contemporary witch's year told with lucidity and verve. That is Ellie Williams, the author of The Liar's Dictionary. On the front it also says, these enchanting words make the world feel less broken. And that's Emma Mitchell, author of The Wild Remedy. And this is a year and six centuries of magic. So essentially this is a year in Alice's practice, but it goes into so much more depth than that because it talks about other points in Alice's life when magical things have occurred and different memories and working with different aspects of magic and there's a section on sex magic, a section about the Kaliak, there's a section about Scottish magic and it is just a really really beautiful way to learn a little bit more about magic if perhaps you're new to the craft and you're just sort of dabbling or you are interested in it and you just want to hear a perspective but also if you are a seasoned witch this is a lovely book it's a really lovely read it, it reads almost like a novel it's not hard at all to read or digest but you're getting so much information and knowledge at the same time so for instance Alice does a lot of foraging where she lives and she talks a lot about how to forage safely when you live in a city or just outside of a city in a town and how Alice uses these herbs and plants in her practice there is a chapter in February that goes into fairies and discusses British folk tales, Scottish folk tales. There's also a section in April that goes into Isabel Gowdy and Emma Wilby's book, The Visions of Isabel Gowdy, Magic, Witchcraft and Dark Shamanism in 17th Century Scotland. 
It says here, Emma Wilby argues that lucidity and detail of Gowdy's confession suggest that the accused genuinely believed her experiences were true. So discussing the story of Gowdy and here Gowdy offers spells, poems for almost every purpose in her confessions, for curse work, for celebrating the devil, for destroying crops and bringing illnesses. So you're also learning a lot at the same time if you know these are things you haven't looked into. So some sections you might know a lot about so if you've already researched quite a lot into fairy lore you might already know some of the stuff that is in this but it's not necessarily like a heavy read it's something that is beautiful at the same time. So you're getting information and knowledge but at the same time you're getting this beautiful kind of spiritual perspective and it's like sitting down with another witch for coffee and hearing their experiences you know since childhood really their magical experiences and that's why it's a really really beautiful book and it's really really nice to put in between some perhaps heavier more academic magical texts or some older kind of grimoires as well if you're exploring that but that's such an enjoyable read the way that Alice writes is very magical very poetic and very beautiful and it feels like an enchantment just in itself it's a lot like self-care reading this book so there's so much in this book that I think is of value and that's beautiful whether or not you're a beginner intermediate or an advanced practitioner there's so much in here that can be you know of service to anyone on the path a witchcraft path or a spiritual path of any kind. So I would really, really highly recommend this. It's a beautiful book. Yeah, don't make my mistake and think it's just an Instagram book because it's it's not. It's really beautiful. It's lovely. Another book that I talked about in my traditional witchcraft reading list is Treading the Mill by Nigel G. Pearson, Workings in Traditional Witchcraft. This book was fantastic. I have heard some people suggest that there are points in the book where Pearson is rather prescriptive. I didn't necessarily feel that. I do see there are ways in which this practitioner does things in their practice, but I just didn't really get that from the book. It really is a fantastic book to start with if you are dipping your toe into traditional witchcraft. I think if you are interested in traditional witchcraft in general, perhaps starting with Keldon's book, which is such a lovely read, and then moving on to this, is a really, really good way to start. There are some beautiful practices here. It discusses traditional witchcraft, it goes into hollowing the compass, and the different tools, the stang, the besom, calling the directions and how you might want to do that. There's a fantastic visionary journey here to determine your directional correspondences because you may wish to form your own depending on where you live and what is around you. There's a compass hollowing a version one and two, and then chants as well that you can use. There's a section on wand crafting which is lovely so it literally goes into how you can craft a wand and different trees that you might wish to make a wand out of and what they are good for. Then a hollowing rite which is essentially like a blessing or a consecration rite. Then there's a section on spell crafting, walk cunning and herbal magic, different protection charms for the home, on journeys and each of these have lovely chants that are very evocative, feel very witchy and beautiful so round the cauldron go in the herbs of magic throw. Elfwort, trefoil, goat's leaf, boar. So Ella compare trefoil, goat's leaf is honeysuckle, and boar is elder. So in the pot, the magic for goat weed, St John's wort, basil, graveyard dust, which is mullein or valerian, twice about it, go we must, elf leaf, so rosemary or lavender, dilly, dill, Juno's tears, vervain, driving off all mortal fears, which vein, rowan, bat's wings, holly, <laughs> dead man's bells, foxgloves, Together bind a magic spell, thrice about the cauldron run, dance and dance and be it done. So it's got this beautiful language with it as well and I love here that beneath is listed all of the different herbs that are associated with their magical names. Then there's a spell for protection on a journey which is just fantastic as well. Again, similar incantation spells and lotions and potions, simples, oils, anointing oils, protection oil, prosperity and abundance oil, then a recipe for a divination salve here with wormwood oil, valerian oil, sink oil, cinnamon essential oil. I actually love cinnamon for astral oils, however I have used them for myself knowing for well it could be irritating and it slightly was. So I would be mm, cautious about using cinnamon but you could use a lot less than what is stated, but I did find it to be really, really powerful for astral work, but again, it's one that can be irritating to the skin. So there's a recipe here for a binding ointment. Then you go into elemental magic and different herbs that are associated with different elemental magic and then different practices, different meditations and spells, 
and rituals that you can use in your practice to evoke the different elements. Then entering the twilight, sensing the sacred is all about incense, gums, resins, flowers, leaves, roots. Next is entering the twilight, which is all about hedge crossing, which is fantastic. This for me is a really, really important part of my practice and like traditional witchcraft practice. So how to protect yourself when you do this kind of work, hedge riding. There's photographs here of different tools. There's about trance work, soul flight, riding the stang, night journeying and different journeys as well. Like here's a journey that you can read out and record, then play back to yourself. Then working with spirits, some information here about the fetch body, the fetch body being a part of yourself that you send out in a different form to do your bidding to do some work for you. A visionary journey for contact with the fetch spirit, ancestors, a section here on ancestors, and then approaching the powers. So this bit I love, this part goes into the god and the different guises of the god, the king of the wildwood, the lord of the mound, there's entering the maze here, the master of light. So it's like different aspects of the god. And then it does the same with the witch mother. So addressing the dame, the queen, the black goddess, and then there are rituals that you can perform with both of these powers. And it's just fantastic. I mean, I think this is a fantastic book and there's probably lots of practices in here that you're not thought to do because I found that. Nigel is a Suffolk traditional witch. So this is a practice in Suffolk. So again, obviously in the UK, it's very unique and specific, but I found that it was inspiring and I didn't find it too prescriptive. Although I think some have, but so many fantastic practices, rituals, journeys, spells, and things that you can utilize in your practice in here. So I'd highly recommend this. It's been a really, really important read for me. And yeah, one again, I really do want to revisit. On a similar line is Folk Witchcraft, and this is by Roger J. Horn, A Guide to Law Land and the Familiar Spirit for the Solitary Practitioner. This is a lovely read, not only because it looks beautiful, the font is absolutely stunning. It's a quick read, it's very simple, straight to the point there are these beautiful illustrations within. First of all, it goes into how to approach the law and the books that you might want to read and the questions that you might want to ask yourselves before considering some of these themes that arise. Some of the themes being, which is gather in spirit form to feast and celebrate, which is perform simple folk magics, etc. They leave their body. So or different things that you might want to look into and then looking into things like the Compendium Maleficarum, essentially a book that actually includes quite a lot of charms and a book that was meant to deter practitioners of folk magic actually preserved quite a lot of charms for future generations of witches. So if you have read Keldon's traditional witchcraft and read up a bit about traditional witchcraft, you may already know that a lot of the tradition that traditional witchcraft is based on, it comes from the trial records and the transcriptions of those accused and their confessions. So people like Isabel Gaudi confessing. And the Compendium Maleficarum, not as famous as the Malleus Maleficarum, however, includes a lot of charms and incantations. And it is actually a really, really quite frightening book. Some of the elements I've read in it, and you do have to be focused. So it's one of those ones that you want to dip in and out of. It mentions here The Complete Herbal by Nicholas Culpepper, Robert Kirk's The Secret Commonwealth of Elves, Fawns and Fairies, The History of the Devil or the Horned God, The West by R. O. Thompson, The Golden Bough again, of course, Margaret Murray's The Witchcraft in Western Europe, these are all books that you might want to get yourself and read throughout your practice. Plant or a Legend by Richard Foucault. I would absolutely recommend reading Charles Godfrey Leland's Aradia really early on because it gives you an idea of how Italian folk practitioners actually used magic in their daily lives to stop bad things from happening to them. So a lot of these people were poor and were you know, using magic to resist their homes being taken away from them and their lives being destroyed. And so I think that that book is it's very poetic, very beautiful. There's a lot of charms, a lot of incantations to the goddess, to Diana. But yeah, absolutely. It has so much depth in it and you can actually see where these people are coming from and the charms that they're using and why. And that's a really, really potent read. So um, he goes into a lot about that. I've gone on and on and on and on. But the rest of the book is very, very straight to the topic. So it goes into astral flight, working with ancestors, working with tree spirits, learning the land, getting to know the seasons and the tides of the land that you are on, working with plant spirits, shape-shifting, the laying of the ring or the circle, so the compass round, the sabbat, so the witch's sabbat, that famous sabbat that witches are to ride to in the middle of the night, spirit flight, conjuring spirits, fetishes and vessels, so vessels for spirits, little homes for them. The illustrations are so cute. And then a practice 
with calling to the old ones. I conjure thee, O great one known by the name of Aradia, teacher and guide of witches past, Aradia of the rue, Aradia of the water, wine and salt, Aradia of the people, Aradia of the sun and moon, Aradia the pilgrim, Aradia who flies above the trees, Aradia of the wind, come, O great one, and bless me with your presence. So then there's the tools of the art, how to lay the ring, the compass round, how to lay a simple ring, a Sabbath rite, an All Hallows Eve rite, Candlemas rite. These are really beautiful. Imolk, really, really beautiful. May's Eve, Midsummer, an Esbat rite, so when you have your full moon, there's a beautiful rite there. A rite of dedication. Conjuration of Aradia. You've got some very, very old charms here. Poppet, the Saxon nine herb charm here. Mugwort, plantain, stune, nettle, chamomile, wagglu, apple, chervil, fennel. And now these nine herbs have power against nine spirits and against nine poisons and against nine infections. You have charm sachets here. The charm here that you would use with your hands and then you would speak the charm to return a baneful magic to the sender so really really simple charms the evil eye a braided charm so not magic speak with the dead a witch's ladder to manifest you have planetary sigils here and some different talismans a rowan red berry charm as a protection for the home there's a section on cartomancy and i know that this author has also written a fantastic book on cartomancy which i would like to read as well theban script here the magical alphabet at the back and then this charm for removal which i've seen in several other books before which is the abracadabra but here is abax akatabax abax akatabax so it says here among the many known charms for removing illness reducing fever banishing baneful spirits and removing unwelcome influences following written and spoken charms appear in many grimoires and folk magical texts this incantation is written on a piece of parchment that is placed on the patient each line dissolving slowly until it is no more so it removes any baneful spirits or any illness so a lovely 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 book of charms i perhaps would suggest reading another book first before reading this so you have a bit more context but there are lots of lovely little nuggets of wisdom i would highly highly recommend this roger j horn spiritual practices informed by the magical currents of scottish cunning craft and appellation yard doctoring so each of these authors have different traditional folk practices that they are drawing from so that's why it's so interesting to bring them all together something that I would like to do is delve a little bit deeper into Scottish traditional craft. So reading Emma Wilby's books about Isabel Galdi is something I would love to do at some point soon. I have been focusing a little bit on reading up about Devonshire magic as well. So a couple of years ago, I read Gemma Gary's Silent as the Trees, and that was the book I read before the next book, which is traditional witchcraft. I would highly recommend Silent as the Trees for learning more about stories and tales of Devon and how charms were used and and folklore and practices in that way but traditional witchcraft which is a Cornish book of ways is more about how to use Cornish practices and Cornish stories in a tradition so in a way it is similar to this book but it outlines different practices different rituals that you can take on in your practice to work in this way but it is based on a Cornish tradition that Gemma has crafted herself through her studies and her knowledge and her practice whereas Silence of the Trees is much more about Devon and the charms, the stories, the lore, the magic that came out of Devon rather than putting it into a practice. But there are overlaps, of course, as well, both being in the southwest, you know, of England, and I'm very, very lucky that that's where I live. Now, this book is fantastic. I would say if you are based in the United States and, you know, you want a traditional witchcraft practice, some of it might not be something you would want to bring into your practice, but I still think you should read it just as I think you should read this. But again, if you are in the southwest of England or in England or you do want to work in a Cornish way, then yeah, this is just perfect. There are certain names for the Sabbath that are different in Cornwall. They are called the Furry Nights. Allentide is Samhain, Montol is the Winter Solstice, Candlemas is in bulk. So you can see some of these are coming from Christian folklore. And that is something, again, that I think Keldon has spoken to, this idea that actually a lot of the traditional charms and folk practices that traditional witches and traditional witchcraft practitioners will use today are preserved through Christianity because they were used beneath the guise of Christianity because that is the only way that they were able to practice and continue to work these charms. In a similar way that in Catholicism, 
There's a book I believe called The Things We Do, which I have not read myself, I would like to read. I did not come from a Catholic background, but I just wanted to read for the purpose of being so interested in it. But the idea being that these people would not have called themselves witches. They might have called themselves healers or something else, or just, you know, Catholic people who did these things. They did these charms. They prayed to their saints and the spirits that they worked with, and that was part of what they did, but it was within their religion of Catholicism. And I think that some people who don't appreciate that sort of Christian influence don't maybe like hearing so much that a lot of these folk charms and traditional charms have been preserved through that period of time when Christianity took over and paganism was sort of not wiped out because it wasn't but when Christianity pervaded and tried to push paganism out. So you can see as well May's Eve, Beltane, Golowan is the summer solstice and then Guldees would be Lunasa or Lammas on the traditional wheel of the year. So these are called the fairy nights, the rites of the years round. There are some fantastic images throughout from Gemma's practice there is a preface here and it kind of lays the groundwork and explains the practice. It discusses the devil within traditional witchcraft because the devil, whilst, as I said, there is that Christian element that runs through some of these practices, the devil in traditional witchcraft is not associated with the Christian devil. It is associated with the wild huntsman, the green man, the booker, and also Odin. So essentially, it's not anything to do with that Christian idea of what the devil is or what Satan is. It's very different. Instead, it's more of a nature spirit. So a god who is of the earth and who preserves and protects as well as destroys. Understanding the distinction between that is quite hard, I think, for a lot of people to get their head around. Quite early on, discuss uh, the abracadabra charm on parchment paper as a protection charm. The satyr square, again, written on parchment. I actually have a satyr square as a protection amulet in our house. And it goes into some famous witches from Cornwall and healers talks about Cornwall's Museum of Witchcraft and Magic and the story between Gerald Garda and Cecil Williamson. So then it goes into the cunning path and it talks about the land, the serpent and becoming. There's also a reference here to gathering sprout, which is to aid and empower the craft walking the serpent path, a path of power and chthonic gnosis. And the sprawl is to draw power from the landscape for future use within witchcraft practices. Connection to the land, animism, serpentine tracks. Then the notion of becoming is linked to trance and connecting to the other world and walking that labyrinth. Similar practice is alluded to here with the maze, that labyrinth, liminal betwixt places. Then there's the dead and the other world, it goes into the booker, the booker do and the booker gwidla, the white god and the black god. So the booker do is associated with storms and winter months, while the booker gwidla may be associated with fair weather, nourishing rains and the summer months. And you can see a kind of parallel there between the oak king and the holly king. And again, referencing the idea of the wild hunt and the devil and the green man and the horned god, all of these different male presenting deity figures. Also referencing here Baphomet depicted by Eliphas Levi. So then places of power, fuggy holes, holy wells, sacred stones, passing through sacred stones for protection and healing, tools of the craft, I think this is something that is in all of the books, so drums, sweeping tools, stones, wind roarers, necklaces, cunning altar, labyrinth, and then it goes into the practice of the witch's compass, the round of the wise. You have the compass round here and the east, south, west, and north roads and the animals that they associated with and here it says by snake and hare and toad and crow and so each of the directions is associated with an animal. The compass right you have here and to invoke the quarters and then a closing ritual again you've got a beautiful depiction there of the compass with the different creatures associated with each direction. So again you can see how the elements are similar between the books but there are different associations also with these. Then you have planetary associations then it goes into my favourite part which is planetary oils and powders and herb blends that you can create yourself and how to work with them. I've got a lot of notes here. Fire of Venus Insect Venus powder, go away powder, love powder. These are just fantastic. Love this section. 
Then you have the planetary squares. So again, it goes into so much that is important to know if this is an area of craft that you are looking to work with. Again, Rowan charms on the red thread as a protection charm, a satyr square as a protection charm. And there it is there. A lot of these books, as you can see, repeat the same charms, but they are almost applied in different ways, performed in different ways, and there's a different tradition within each, which is lovely. So there's a blackthorn charm here, eight blackthorn spikes, counter curses, lifting ill influence, the horseshoe charm, which so many people have horseshoes in their homes, I've noticed this over the years. The abracadabra charm, again, Bought charming, and this in a sense is a form of kind of sympathetic magic in that the idea is, is that you pass the charm on. There are some fantastic images throughout of Gemma practicing. Love knots, again similar to what we have seen in this book, there are some similar kinds of workings. The house doll, again is sort of like a fetish or a vessel, a spirit vessel, something for a spirit to live in. Candle and pin magics, how to use a needle or a pin in a candle almost as a poppet. So there is so much in this book that I absolutely love. So this is such a valuable book if you're interested in traditional witchcraft, specifically Cornish traditional witchcraft, but so valuable for anyone practicing any kind of traditional witchcraft. And yeah, absolutely a must read. And even if you're not practicing traditional witchcraft, even if you're Wiccan, or if you are an eclectic pagan, eclectic witch, solitary practitioner, and you just want to gain more insight and knowledge and perhaps apply some of the charms within some of these books in your magical practice, you can do that too. It's a fantastic book and highly recommend it. Next up is Harold Roth's The Witching Herbs, 13 Essential Plants and Herbs for Your Magical Garden. This is such a fantastic book. If you're interested in herbalism, if you're interested in working with herbs in your magical practice, I cannot recommend this book enough. So it focuses in on 13 plants first of all and that's amazing because you don't need to know everything about a hundred different plants and herbs to have a green magical practice or to work with those herbs. I'm not a herbalist, I'll just say that. Herbalism is something I'd like to learn to do a course in at some point. Essentially this book does so much more than just a list of correspondences, that's not what it is, it's just not. It goes so much deeper than that because it talks about cultivating the witch's garden at first, so like how you want to consider planting depending on where you are and different things that you can use. So here, the outdoor treatment for planting cold stratification. This is something I didn't really know much about, but literally sowing your seeds and putting them in the freezer so that they get used to the cold. Snow planting as well that you can do. Then nurturing seedlings, how to strengthen them, dampening off, potting up. So it's actually like a really great gardening resource as well. And that's another thing, you know, if you are interested in working with herbs, botanicals in your magical practice, reading gardening books, fantastic, you know, and it's something you can get your hands on. So if you're someone who's not even openly practicing, you could go to the library, you don't even have to buy the books, go to the library, get a few books on gardening, and you'll learn so much about how to tend to and raise your own plants from seedling, or even if you've purchased a plant, how to look after it, how to nurture it. And this book I love because it does go into how to connect to the plant spirit and what you might wish to work with that plant for. So the herbs that Harold focuses on in this book are poppy, clary sage, yarrow, rue, hyssop, vervain, mugwort, my favourite, wormwood, thorn apple, wild tobacco, henbane, belladonna and mandrake. So there are some toxic plants in this, there are some beautiful illustrations of course. And it discusses different lore around the herbs, so with reference to Aradia for poppy and use in childbirth and the twilight sleep it was referred to. Poppy was often combined with the unpredictable belladonna to furnish a hypnotic pain-killing drug used in childbirth and referred to as the twilight sleep. That sounds rather terrifying. Ooh. So there is a lot here. Then some interesting recipes that you may not want to use. So here, a pricey cocktail, Thomas Sydenham's 1669 recipe for laudanum contained the following ingredients. A pound of sherry wine, two ounces of opium, one ounce of saffron, one ounce of powder of cinnamon, one ounce of powder of cloves. Saffron greatly potentiates opiates and so can make them even more dangerous. I do wonder if real saffron was used in this recipe, however, given its cost, today one ounce costs about $140. So this is a cocktail you would not want to use. There is so much here to go into. Would love to read it again as well. I think I'd like to read all of these books again, to be honest with you. So then Clary Sage, a tincture. Yarrow, the tale of the werewolf, because Yarrow is 
fantastic for shape shifting and glamour magic associated with Mercury, for that trickster kind of spirit. Then you have Rue, which of course is a very, very popular witch's plant, making Four Thieves vinegar, Rue sanctification powder and hexing powder, hyssop as an asperger, and it's mentioned within the Bible, so Psalm 51 verse 7, purge me with hyssop till I am pure, wash me till I am whiter than snow. And the idea here that this is a different form of hyssop. So the hyssop in the Hebrew Bible is Origanum Suricum, which is biblical hyssop, whereas the hyssop that is now most familiar is the Hyssopus officinalis, is camphorous and cold, so it talks about the different properties and elemental associations. Harold Roth also refers a lot to how the plants were described by Nicholas Culpepper in terms of their planetary associations, etc., and whether they were dry, hot, those kinds of aspects. So of course there are lots of warnings as well here, it says about hyssop containing a high proportion of chemicals known to lower the seizure threshold in humans and other animals. So there's lots of warnings, vervain here, a plant to work with for protection and for divination. Then flying ointments with vervain, then mugwort and mugwort as one of Woden's herbs as seen in the Saxon nine herb charm, wormwood and the green fairy and of course its association with absinthe and how it was used, thorn apple as one of the weird sisters, thorn apple in the garden how to grow, then wild tobacco and the differences between the different types of tobacco and how it was used, so interesting that chapter. Henbane again reference here the twilight sleep because it was also used in that, it sounds terrifying. The alkaloid present in varying amounts in the plants we call the weird sisters, datura, mandrake, belladonna and henbane was also part of the flying ointment. There's references throughout to flying ointment because a lot of these herbs were used within buying ointments. The practice in US pharmacopoeia with henbane, how it's been used, belladonna, the evil eye. Even though datura, thorn apple, can be quite brutal, the brutality is more or less expected. It does not arise out of meanness as much as out of the plant spirit's ignorance of its own strength and the flimsiness of mortals. The same cannot be said of belladonna because it says here belladonna's brutality feels more like pure malice. And that's one of the reasons why I feel like it's really interesting. I spoke about this in my video where I discussed how I made a mullein oil and salve. I discussed a little bit about having wild lettuce and a black nightshade in our garden when we moved in, so new build property. And the energy that I got from the wild lettuce actually was more chaotic and almost more baneful in a way than the black nightshade. But yes, it does say here that Belladonna's brutality feels more like pure malice. I associate this plant with the evil eye and with the malefic works of witchcraft that can indeed, sometimes without any help or from a reed or karma or anything else, come back to bite witches just because they're there. So it is a beautiful, beautiful plant, of course, and something I wouldn't want to mess with or grow, to be honest with you. And as beautiful as it is, and there are suggestions for how to use belladonna here to make a magical ink, it's not something that I will be using. And for your information, if you haven't seen my other video, the wild lettuce next to the black nightshade in our garden, we are getting rid of. It's still quite cold out here, so we haven't really ventured out into our garden much. So we literally moved in just as winter was coming in. So we haven't really been in the garden but we have small children and it's not something I'm willing to risk. So off on a tangent there. Then Mandrake here, and this is so interesting. Mandrake and Aphrodite, Mandrake and Hanged Man, Mandrake and Hecate, Mandragora. Here, Hildegard of Bingham was far more wary of this plant and her attitude indicates that Mandrake may have already had associations with witchcraft. She advised that the Mandrake root be put into a spring for a day and a night as soon as it was harvested because it had the devil in it and it would be a good tool for dark magic if left unwashed for too long after harvesting. There is so much that you can find about the mandrake online. I think it's a popular plant to understand from a magical perspective and a folklore perspective if you're interested in learning. And then at the back there are notes on each of the chapters, like footnotes, obviously a conclusion and a bibliography with books and primary sources. So, so much in here, so much research. I would say absolutely Harold Roth knows the stuff about plants and how to work with them, how to connect to the plant spirits, how to grow them, how to nurture them and how to get the most out of them in your magical practice. It was such a good read. I cannot recommend enough for anyone interested in working with herbs, plants in their magical practice. Next up, a book that I wanted to read for ages. I picked this up as soon as it was out and I waited until the end of the year to read it. Rebel Witch by Kellyanne Maddox, Carve the Craft That's Yours Alone. This is such a lovely book. Now, not only is it a beautiful book and with each chapter there are these beautiful design sigils that have been designed by Jenny Lloyd 
as well as the front cover. There are opportunities to write it, opportunities to journal, and to try out practices in the book. This is a great book for beginners, it really, really is. But there's so much more than that as well, and I think it's a nice way to revisit certain things, and a nice way to kind of get you out of a rut. If you are someone who has been practicing magic and witchcraft for a long time, and you want to revisit some basics, but also get the perspective of Kellyanne. If you're watching me, you probably have watched Kellyanne Maddox on YouTube before, and her channel is fantastic, a wealth of knowledge, Knowledge, so much incredible information, experience, practices and ideas come from Kellyanne Maddox and the general ethos of the book Rebel Witch, it is summed up in that, you know, it's yours, it, this is your practice and you make it what it is for you and that is such an amazing way to approach witchcraft because it's not prescriptive and because you can make magic out of anything, you know. Rebel Witch does not seek to tell you what to do, its aim is to spark inspiration and encourage you to create a truly authentic practice that reflects your unique experiences, tastes and personalities. Kellyanne speaks to that, you know, to moments when she's felt that she didn't need to cleanse the space or moments when she's wanted to construct rituals and so she's written them out and moments of spontaneous rituals and there's just so many nuggets of wisdom. Even if you are not a beginner witch and you know all the information about the Sabbaths, etc., and you know how to do a lot of the practices that Kellyanne speaks to. It's still a lovely book because it prompts you to think about things. It prompts you to journal things that you might not have thought about before. I mean, you might have an idea of what you like doing and what you don't like doing in your practice and what your focus is, but there might be other things that you've not really thought about why you don't like doing them. And there are points in this book where you're sort of prompted to consider those things and there's no pressure to decide either way. Just the act of journaling some of these things is really important and I think when it comes to things like ethics as well, that is something I think is really really important for witches to understand about themselves and I think it is a growing and evolving thing but just journaling about it every so often is really really supportive and this is a beautiful book for that. So it helps you to explore so many areas of your practice in this way. The chapters are really really short so there are about 22 chapters I think. There is a fantastic reading list at the end. I think you could work through this book really slowly throughout a year perhaps and if you are new to witchcraft, fantastic book to start with because not only does it give you that basic information, it doesn't just give you a list of spells and like oh another table of correspondences. It encourages you to get your hands dirty, to get to know the stones, crystals, herbs, plants, connect with the spirits, connect with the deities, understand what your paradigm is. An invitation to become a witch on your own terms. It's not telling you how to witch. It's giving you the tools and some of the knowledge that you need. It's giving you that blueprint and an opportunity to decide what being a witch is for you and why this book is so, so valuable, not only for beginners, but for intermediate and advanced practitioners as well. You may not get so much from the sections about the Sabbaths, but you might get a lot from journaling some of these things. So for instance, considering when you can put sacred days into your own wheel of the year. So perhaps you only celebrate the cross quarter days, perhaps you only celebrate the equinoxes and the solstices, but there might be other celebrations in and around that you can use and put into your own wheel of the year so that you construct a calendar for yourself. It's a really, really beautiful book and there's lots and lots in here that made me go, oh, that's such a lovely idea. I love the way that Kellyanne suggests that. It's so magical and to, you know, use some of Kellyanne's phraseologies, you know, it makes you fizzy. Like this book is so special and magical and I cannot recommend it enough. I think probably I would recommend it more for beginners, but I still would recommend it for intermediate and advanced level practitioners as well. So much value in this book. Fantastic, fantastic book. And I cannot wait to read more from Kellyanne. And if you have never seen Kellyanne's channel, please go over and watch. Not only is there so much information and so much of value there, Kellyanne's just lovely and she's so artistic and creative and bubbly and it's just a joy and a pleasure to watch Kellyanne and she comes from a very authentic place as well, you know, really going into her own experiences and how that shaped her craft as well. So, so much value, fantastic book, love it. And the final book I absolutely loved, it was The Witch's Path by Thorn Mooney and this is advancing your craft at every level. Now this book, again, so incredible for 
figuring out things about your practice that are important and vital for you and ways in which you can practice, ways in which that perhaps your practice has become stagnant and why. And there are journaling prompts throughout that can help you to understand and figure out these aspects and how to shift up practices. This is a book I want to read again because there is so much in here, so many journaling prompts that will help you to figure out why something may be stagnant and how you can switch it up and exercises as well. So there are exercises here to find your witchcraft in terms of utilizing the different elements and how to connect to them. It goes into aspects of a practice that would be interesting and helpful and supportive for anyone who is new to their practice to understand. But also I think that this isn't so much of a beginner's book. I think if you are a beginner, start with this and then you could read something like this. Perhaps if you've been practicing for a little bit of time, this is a better book to read because it's advancing your craft at every level. So it's sort of when you get to a point, you might not even feel static, like you're static or like there's stagnancy. You're asking the questions, what does it mean to be devoted? So why on earth do people do it? Why on earth would a witch who perhaps should only be concerned with controlling their world through magic choose to be devoted? So it's asking you these questions and the beginning does give fantastic context as well which is really really important but I probably wouldn't advise someone who's brand new to a witchcraft practice to read this but I still think that they'd get a lot from it but I think that if they did read it first they'd probably want to come back to it a few years down the line or maybe a year down the line so it goes into what is witchcraft sacred space devotions so working with deities there are exercises here there's the journaling prompts ritual and magic personal practice and building your own personal practice, working rights, studying a relationship between practice and study, approaching everything with a beginner's mind as well, which is so, so special and important. Many ways to learn, then connecting with community. This is a really, really important part of the book, I think. And then challenges that you can come up against. And then at the back there is a fantastic bibliography and then further reading. So here it goes into different books that you might want to read. Bell Hooks, Teaching to Transgress, Education of the Practice of Freedom. So books that aren't necessarily about magic, but that will support you in your learning of witchcraft. Eliphas Levi, The Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic, A New Translation. Laura O'Brien, A Practical Guide to Pagan Priesthood, Community Leadership and Vocation. Laura O'Brien runs the Irish Pagan School, and I have done several courses with Laura O'Brien about the Morrigan specifically, and their work is fantastic. And at the back there's this lovely section for notes as well. It's not so big, so you probably do want a journal but I think maybe this is for like if you want to just jot some notes down as you're reading or perhaps if you haven't managed to pick up a journal to go with the book and you want to just start straight away because you started reading it and you have to just get some stuff out on paper. This book makes you think, it prompts you to think and it will engage you in your craft, it will make you excited about your practice again if you are not already. It's quite a slim book, very easy to work through but again I think it's something that you could work through slowly. I have read the whole book cover to cover but now what I tend to do is go back through and actually use the journaling prompts. So that is something that I would like to do with this book next. I'm absolutely thrilled with this book and all of these books are absolutely fantastic books. I'm so glad I read them. I cannot recommend them enough. I know some of them are more specific than others, but hopefully there's something here that you may wish to take forward and read for yourself for your practice. So I hope that this has been interesting for you. If you have read some of these books or you have anything to comment or ask any questions, then please leave it in the comments box below. I'd love to hear from you. I'd also love to hear about your favorite witchcraft and magic books of 2021. Do leave them in the comments box below. I love to receive recommendations, so please do that. If you did enjoy the video, please do click the thumbs up button, give the video a like, and share it with anyone who is also interested in witchcraft, magic, spirituality, and tarot, and divination. If you'd like to support the channel a little bit further, I have an Instagram page and a TikTok that I will leave on screen and in the description box below so you can click through and see what I'm doing over there. I also have a Buy Me A Coffee page if you would like to donate a little bit to Buy Me A Coffee to show your appreciation for everything I share here on the channel. Also, if you've been watching my channel and enjoying and you've not yet subscribed, please do subscribe, and while you're subscribing, don't forget to hit that little bell notification that's how YouTube is going to let you know when I create and upload videos just like this. So with all of that said, thank you again so much for joining me. I hope that you stay well and safe and I look forward to seeing you again in another video really soon. Take care. Bye.